event that is celebrated 52 times every year? The most rational explanation for this phenomenon is that Jesus appeared personally to people after his resurrection and convinced them that it was true. The Christian faith, the Christian church, the Christian Sunday. Let me talk with you briefly about the Christian ordinances. Now, for those of you who don't know what that is and don't mean to be confusing, and the ordinances are the two things we practice as a part of our church beside worship and teaching. In, in our church, according to the New Testament, those two things are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Let's talk about baptism. Every week, almost without fail, we have someone who is baptized by immersion in our baptistry. They give their testimony, and then the officiating pastor says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They are placed under the water, and they are brought up out of the water. And the Scripture teaches us that every time we do that, we are giving an example of what happened to Jesus. He went into the tomb, and he was raised victoriously out of the tomb. And when a believer is baptized, he is identifying with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is saying, I once was this way, but old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Baptism is a testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the Lord's Supper, which is also a testimony. As you know, the cup is a representation of the blood of Christ and the bread of the body of Christ. It is a remembrance of his death, but when you read Acts 2, you discover that you're supposed to participate in communion with joy, looking forward to the fact that Jesus is risen from the dead. One of the great apologists of our day is a man by the name of J.P. Moreland. He explains the significance of communion like this. He said, what's odd is that these early followers of Jesus did not ever get together to celebrate his teachings or how wonderful he was. They came together to have a celebration meal for one reason, to remember that Jesus had been publicly slaughtered in a grotesque and humiliating way. Now he said, think about this in modern terms. If a group of people loved John F. Kennedy, they might meet regularly to remember his confrontation with Russia or his promotion of civil rights or his charismatic personality. But they're never going to celebrate the fact that Lee Harvey Oswald murdered him because, you see, for him, that was the end. That was awful. That was despair. That was death. That was it. But when Jesus was crucified and came back from the grave, it wasn't the end. It was the beginning. It was the beginning of hope for all who feared death because now their leader had come through the process of death, walked out of the tomb, put his foot on Satan's neck and said, I have gained victory over death. And because I have done it, you, if you put your trust in me, can do it also. We celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ because it's the only hope that we have as followers of Christ. Last but not least, here is to me the most visceral of all of the evidences, and that is the changed lives of people today. We know the resurrection is true because we see what the risen Christ does in our lives. It's like many of us have our own resurrections, isn't it? We are dead, we are lost, and then Jesus Christ comes and he gives us new life. I know that the Savior lives today because he lives within my own heart, and I witness what happens to people when they give their hearts to Christ. He makes them into new people from the inside out. That's why I love to preach on Easter, because the story of the Christ who came back from the dead is the greatest story ever told. I want to leave you with two thoughts. One thought is for those of you who are already Christians. You already know the Lord. You believe in the resurrected Christ. You've accepted him. And one is for those of you who may be searching and you're not sure about all of this. Both of them happen to be involved with resurrection. One of them with the resurrection of Christ and one with the resurrection of Lazarus. On Jesus' resurrection morning, two women went to the tomb, as you know, 
to visit the tomb, and instead of finding Jesus' body when they got there, they found two angels in the tomb. And the angels said to the two women, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Today, like the women at the tomb, if we are not careful, we often seek for the living among the dead. We try to find peace and hope and forgiveness, even as followers of Christ, in the wrong world. It's not in that world because he's not in that world. We often look among the dead for our hope and peace and forgiveness, but he is not there. He is risen. Don't find your hope there. My hope isn't there. My hope is in Jesus Christ. If my hope were in the world, I'd be in despair today. He is risen. He's alive. Don't be looking for the living among the dead. Amen. I have to say it myself, I will. (laughs) Number two. One day Jesus stood at the tomb of Lazarus, and he was comforting Lazarus' sister because Lazarus had died. He was in the tomb. The Bible says he was so dead he had begun to stink. He was stinking dead. And Jesus was trying to comfort Lazarus' sister. And I want you to listen to what he said to her. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Wow. What did Jesus say? He said, I, Jesus, am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, though you may die, you shall live. That sounds like doublespeak. What does he mean? Well, the word die has two meanings. The word death has two meanings. The word death itself means separation. Uh, And so death is, first of all, physically the separation of your soul from your body. When you die, your soul leaves your body. Your body stays here, but you aren't there because the real you has, has left. The New Testament says for a Christian, when you die, it's absent from the body, present with the Lord. So death is, first of all, physical. It's when we die physically, our soul is separated from the body. But the Bible says there's a second kind of death, and that's the Hello, I'm David Jeremiah, and welcome to Turning Point. In our current series, Ordinary People, Extraordinary Faith, we're discovering what it takes to have the kind of faith that gets God's attention. There are two people in the Bible about whom something very unique can be said, that they walked with God. Noah was one of the men, and the other is the subject of today's message on Turning Point titled, He Walked With God. You'll learn who that other person was if you join me for today's edition of Turning Point. To share with friends and family, perfect for gift giving. Request your Colors of Creation calendar from Turning Point today. The story of Enoch is told in just nine verses in the entire Bible. Those verses are found in Genesis, Hebrews, and Jude. In fact, Genesis 5, which provides for us the most information about Enoch in the entire Bible, describes Enoch's life in 48 words. Throughout history, many people have made mysterious and some of them reverent comments about Enoch. And many of these perspectives perhaps have been helpful. Some of them have been speculative. And what we do know from the Bible, however, is that Enoch, whose name means dedicated or initiated, Enoch was the seventh in line from Adam. 
Enoch was the father of Methuselah and the great grandfather of Noah. And more importantly, he is the first man in the Bible of whom it was said that he walked with God. Say that with me. He walked with God. Now, there is nothing about Enoch that would make us believe he was anything other than an ordinary man. I, I mean, he was not an administrator like Moses or a statesman like Daniel. His experience is a reminder to us that the book of Hebrews chapter 11 is not about extraordinary people who had faith. It's about ordinary people who had extraordinary faith. And Enoch was just the kind of person who might live next door to you. He was an ordinary person. Hebrews tells us that he pleased God. Genesis tells us that he walked with God. And Jude tells us that he witnessed for God. We begin by looking back in the Bible to the fifth chapter of Genesis where the story of Enoch is recorded. And here we read, first of all, about Enoch walking with God. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. And after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now the cause of his walk with God is quite interesting. For it says in Genesis 5.22, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God. Apparently, he did not walk with God for the first 65 years of his life. And then something happened that changed everything. He had his first son. Something happened to him that caused him to change. How many of you know children will cause you to walk with God like nothing you've ever tried before? And that has been the experience of many folks. I've noticed as a pastor that there are two times when people are uniquely sensitive to what God wants with them. The first one is when you get married. Oh, what an awesome responsibility that is. When you get married, you realize, I'm not just responsible for me anymore. I'm responsible for me and one other person. It's a very sobering thing, especially for men. The other time is when you have your first child. After Enoch's son was born, Enoch began to walk with God, but there's more to it than that. Enoch named his son Methuselah, which means when he is dead, it shall be sent. That's exactly what the word means. When he is dead, it shall be sent. When this boy's name is placed next to the information that we have about him from the book of Jude, we began to see what was going on in Enoch's life. Here's what Jude wrote. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute. execute judgment on all to convict all who are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him apparently what happened was this when Enoch was given his first son God told Enoch to call him Methuselah and that would be a signal that when Methuselah died God would bring judgment upon the earth. When he is dead, it shall be sent. Now, first of all, this demonstrates the kind of environment that Enoch lived in. He lived in an environment that deserved the judgment of God. The environment before the flood would make what's going on in our culture today seem like a Sunday school picnic. It was a time of wickedness and rebellion against God that ultimately brought the judgment of the flood and destroyed the whole world. And it shows also the grace of Almighty God. Listen to this. The man who lived the longest in the history of the world 
is the man Methuselah. As you know, he lived 969 years. And the man God chose to be the bridge between his warning and his judgment was Methuselah, who lived 969 years. God said, until Methuselah dies, the judgment won't come. And then God gave Methuselah 969 years of life, as if to say, I want to be as gracious to you as I can be. God is a God of grace and mercy, and he extends his mercy over and over again. Methuselah's life was a period of grace before the judgment of the flood. And who was the oldest man who ever lived? Methuselah. He lived 969 years. Now, there's an interesting little mathematical exercise that we can do with regard to this that's quite interesting. And I want to ask you to put on your thinking caps for a moment and follow me. And some of it will be on the screen, but some of it you'll just have to gather as we go along. If we make the creation of Adam year one, and we calculate the years that are recorded in Genesis 5, we discover that Methuselah was born in the year 687 from the creation of Adam. If we add 969 to 687, the total we get is 1656. The number of the year in which Methuselah died was 1656. That includes 687 years from Adam to Methuselah, 969 years of Methuselah's life. Now, just hold that for a moment. I'm sure you got all these numbers. If we continue our calculation, listen to this. We discover that Noah was born in the year 1056 from the creation of Adam. And since Noah was 600 years old when the flood came, according to Genesis 7, 6, it means that the flood came in the year 1656, the exact year that Methuselah died. The Bible is pretty incredible, isn't it? Exactly as God told him, God made Methuselah a prophet by the virtue of his own name and his life. That's the cause of Enoch's walk with God. Now notice the circumstances of his life. Enoch lived in a time of great depravity. I know that's not a pretty word. If I were to say to you, uh, you live in a depraved world, you would say, oh no, pastor, we're not depraved. Let me tell you how early depravity starts. Did you know it starts real early? Here's a list of the depravity of man as expressed in the life of a toddler. You ready for this? These are their property laws. If I like it, it's mine. If it's in my hand, it's mine. If I can take it from you, it's mine. If I had it a little while ago, it's mine. If it's mine, you must never appear to allow it to be yours in any way. If I'm doing or building something, all the pieces are mine. If it looks just like mine, it's mine. If I saw it first, it's mine. If you are playing with something and you put it down, it automatically becomes mine. If it's broken, it's yours. <laughs> That's pretty funny, isn't it? Except if you have toddlers, it's exactly the way it is. Expressed in the life of children. Enoch lived in a very difficult time. His circumstances would make, uh, we would not believe it if we tried to even compare it to the thing. I've been writing books about what's going on in our culture, so I'm pretty familiar with what's happening. It doesn't even measure up to what's here. The Bible says, by faith he lived before the Almighty God in a righteous and noble way. And the circumstances of his life were not used as an excuse not to walk with God. Let us agree today that maybe walking with God is a challenge in our culture, but our circumstances and our culture can never be allowed to be an excuse for us to just say, well, nobody can do it, so I'm not going to do it. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15 reminds us that children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world is our mantra. What are we? We're children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, and we're to shine as lights in the world. 
Men and women, we got to quit complaining about the time in which we live. I hear this everywhere I go. I wish I could have lived in the good old days, whatever they were and whenever they were. You're here on earth today because God put you here and he wants you here. Could have put you any time, any place. He could have dropped you down in the Renaissance if he had wanted to. But he put you here. He put me here. And we need to embrace our culture and say, Lord God, thank you for allowing me to be alive in such a time and, and to help me, Lord God, be a shining light in the midst of the darkness. One thing you need to recognize is one of the reasons why the Word of God, especially the New Testament, is so relevant to our days is because the Word of God, the New Testament, was written to a group of Christians who were living under the domination of the Roman Empire and under great stress and pressure and wickedness and evil. And the Word of God is filled with encouragement through them to us that we can be the kind of people God wants us to be no matter what's going on around us. Our faith does not depend on our circumstances. Our faith depends on Christ. And that's a good lesson to take from these early experiences that we see in the life of Enoch. I want to ask you to walk with me to the next step in Enoch's life, and that's the choice of Enoch's walk with God. It says in verse 22, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God. And again in verse 24, and Enoch walked with God. Twice in this passage, we are simply told that Enoch walked with God. In the crisis of his life, at the birth of his son, and perhaps because of a special revelation from God, Enoch determined to walk with God. I don't know when it was or how it was, but one day shortly after the birth of Methuselah, Enoch began to recognize the need he had in his life for a closer relationship with God. And one day he just made the decision. He just made the choice. He just said, from this moment on, I am going to walk with God. And many have followed in his footsteps. Perhaps you have. This whole matter of choice often gets lost in our discussion of the Christian life. We are so much of the time what we choose to be. When I first started out in the ministry, decisions seem to be much easier for people to make. Today, decisions are hard because everybody wants to maintain the opportunity to keep as many options open as possible. Isn't that true? We're a multiple choice generation. And the Bible tells us we have to make a choice. And here's what we learn about Enoch. There was a day in his life when Enoch chose to walk with God. And then notice the communion that he had with God. So close was Enoch's walk with God. Just, just imagine this now. We know that the Bible says no one knows when, the, when Jesus is coming back except the Father. Even Jesus doesn't know it. So you understand that God is very, very careful with information about what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. But Almighty God chose to tell Enoch that at a certain time, after a certain event, God was going to bring judgment to this earth. He chose to share that with Enoch. Like Abraham, Enoch was a friend of God. They communicated and they had communion together. Now, here's one that's almost off the chart for me. Sometimes I read the Bible and I'm encouraged. Sometimes I'm just overwhelmed. Sometimes I'm just intimidated. Are you ever intimidated by the Bible? Well, here's one of the most intimidating things you'll ever read in the Bible. It's in Genesis 5, 23. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and he walked with God for 300 years. Enoch walked with God for three centuries. His unbroken communion stretched out over these many years so that he could demonstrate his faith and his faithfulness. His life was his walk, and his walk was his life, and he didn't depart from the right hand or to the left hand. He just walked with God for three centuries. And we wonder, can we walk with God for one more week? Enoch did it for three centuries. Go, Enoch. And then the second thing that we learn about Enoch, apart from the fact of him walking with God, was that Enoch pleased God. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Uh, Ron Dunn has written that the great miracle about Enoch is not that he bypassed death to get to heaven, but that he pleased God. That's the miracle. 
Here's a man who pleased God. Our goal as God's people ought to be to please God. And we understand that in our human relationships, don't we? My great goal is to please Donna. Her goal is to please me. We work at that. We want to do that with all our hearts. Why would it seem so strange that the God who has created us and has provided salvation for us and meets the needs we have in our life, wouldn't it be normal and natural that the God you love would be, would be measured in your own heart by whether or not you were living to please him? Let me ask us all the question. Let me ask me this question. Am I doing in my life what I do to please others, to please myself, or do I long to please Almighty God? Let me tell you, it won't always come in conflict, but there will be times when pleasing others and pleasing God won't be on the same page. The next time you're tempted to do something that seems like it's in the gray area and you don't know if you should do it or not, just ask yourself this question. or Ask God this question. God, I'm about to... Will this bring pleasure to your heart? I'll tell you one thing. It'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. <laughs> keep you on the road where you can walk with God. And then in Jude verses 14 and 15, we have this whole issue of Enoch witnessing for God. The Bible says that Enoch prophesied the coming judgment. God used Enoch as a prophet, a testifier of things to come. Finally, we have the most commonly known thing about Enoch, and that is Enoch going to be with God. We have him walking with God, pleasing God, witnessing for God. But the thing that's quite amazing about Enoch was he just went to be with God. It says in Hebrews 11:5, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. He went from walking with God on the earth to walking with God in heaven. There's a hint in verse 5 that when Enoch disappeared, people went looking for him. If that happened, then it was a parallel to what happened when God took Elijah in a similar way through the fiery chariot. Look now, it says in 2 Kings, there are 50 strong men with your servants. Please let them go and search for your master, lest perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up, cast him upon some mountain into some valley. Therefore they sent 50 men, and they searched for Elijah for three days, and they couldn't find him because he didn't fall down on a mountain. He went way past the mountains to be with God. There was no finding Elijah, and there was no finding Enoch. The Bible says Enoch was walking along one day, and God took him. Maybe he was having lunch with a friend, and all of a sudden his friend looked around and Enoch was gone. Maybe he was with his family or his grandchildren, and all of a sudden he disappeared from the living room. Where's Enoch? He's gone. He was nowhere to be found. The Lord took him. And of course you know where I'm going with this. Enoch is the first illustration in the Bible of the rapture. Just what happened to Enoch is going to happen to the people of God someday. You know how I know that? The Bible tells me so. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, This we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain, watch this, shall be caught up shall be taken. The same concept. In fact, Enoch, Elijah, Stephen, the Lord Jesus, all are prefiguring the rapture of the church. One of these days, if you're a Christian, you'll be with your friends who don't know the Lord Jesus, and you will do a disappearing act from which they will never recover. They will never see you again on this earth because you will be taken and you will not be. I love the phrase, and he was not. <laughs> Where is old Enoch? Well, he's not. <laughs> he's in heaven. He's gone. And that's the way it will be for us. If we put our trust in Jesus Christ, the Bible says that when you put your trust in Jesus Christ and you become a Christian, that one day the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back before the tribulation ham hammers the earth, and he's going to catch up everybody who has put their trust in him. There will be an event. Now, 
Here's your host and Bible teacher, Dr. David Jeremiah. Welcome to our current teaching series, Revealing the Mysteries of Heaven. You and I know that when we make sensible choices in our diet, our reward is good health. And when we cultivate growth in our spiritual life, we reap the rewards of peace, joy, and contentment. When we have a good driving record, our behavior is rewarded by discounted insurance rates. You see, rewards are built into the very fabric of our lives at every level, even at the spiritual level. The expectation of knowing future rewards are coming should motivate us to live lives today that are pleasing to God. I've titled today's message, Heaven's Oscars, to make the point that the grandest awards this earth has to offer can't compare with the rewards in store for Christians in heaven. Today, you'll learn what those rewards are and how to make sure you receive them on this edition of Turning Point. Within the last few years, most of you have noticed awards ceremonies are out of kilter. You know, I did some homework this week and I found there are at least 42 of them. There are enough award ceremonies to watch one almost every week of the year and I didn't get all of them. We have Academy Awards and we have Choice Awards and Prism Awards and Screen Actors Guild Awards and Country Music Awards and Grammy Awards and Soap Opera Digest Awards. It seems as if we're into awards. But there's an award day coming and there are Oscars to be given out like the world has never, ever dreamed of. I need to tell you that when we talk about rewards in heaven, a lot of people get a little nervous because there's this mentality that a lot of folks have that if you're living for God out of the love for your heart, why would you want any award? Why would you need a reward? They say something like, well, you know, if you give an award uh, to someone for good works as a Christian, that's like... uh, trying to get your children to be good by offering them candy, which they view as an inferior strategy. Some people say we should not be lured into goodness by promises of a bonus, for goodness is its own reward. While that argument sounds logical and spiritual, it is entirely out of harmony with what the Bible teaches. The Bible never defends the concept of rewards, The idea is accepted as if it is the most natural and normal thing for us to expect. Not only was this idea accepted, but it was at the very core of the growth of the early church. The historian Gibbon traces the rapid progress of Christianity throughout Rome, and he uses his analysis to isolate five reasons why the church grew so rapidly in its early days, and here they are the zeal of the early Christian, the power of miracles, the pure morals of the Christians, the compact church organization, and the belief in future rewards and future punishment. As you read through the Bible, starting even in the Old Testament, you discover that rewards is a common theme. And as you read the Bible with that in mind, things start jumping off the page everywhere you go. Starts in the Old Testament in places like Psalm 58:11 that says, So that men will say, Surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely he is God who judges in the earth. Or Psalm 62, 12, Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy, for you render to each one according to his work. When you come to the New Testament, the New Testament opens with the Lord's promise of rewards in the in the Beatitudes, you remember this passage in Matthew 5, 11, and 12. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you. Say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. When you go all the way through the New Testament and you come to the last book in the Bible, Revelation 22, verse 12 says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. And throughout the entire New Testament, rewards are assumed to be a part of the Christian's future experience. Hebrews 6, 10 through 12 says that God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown toward his name. Luke 18, 29 and 30 says, 
Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. Mark 9, 41 says, For whoever gives you a cup of water in my name, because you belong to Christ, assuredly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Mark 10, 29 and 30 says, Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel's sake, now watch this, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. I don't know about you, but I haven't found any place where I can get a hundredfold on any investment I make. But when you serve the Lord, he tells you right out in the scripture that he rewards you not only in this life, but in the life to come. Now, let's talk about how this is going to happen. First of all, let's look at the day of heaven's rewards. The Bible tells us that after the church, all of the believers are taken to heaven by the rapture or resurrection. Individual believers will be judged for their works as Christians and special rewards will be handed out. This is the clear teaching of the Word of God, that even though we have been saved from our sin, one day you and I are going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat, sometimes referred to as the beam seat, and the Lord is going to judge us for our conduct and for our, our work as a believer. Romans 1412 says so then each of us shall give an account of himself to God That's speaking to believers Second Corinthians 510 says for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ That each may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad Ephesians 6 8 says knowing that whatever good thing each one of us does this he will receive back from the Lord whether slave or free and 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15 tells us, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. And if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, at that day we call Judgment Day, Jesus Christ will see, listen to me now, he will see through all of our posturing and all of our spinning of who we are and what we do. He will see into our heart for the motives, for the reasons why we do what we do. He will get past all the exterior things that we want others to see and he will see us and he does now notice Paul says that everyone's work will become clear there will be no second guessing on any awards the one who sorts it out is the final authority there's no appeal beyond him when he gives you an award you have been awarded and if he doesn't give you one it's over you don't need to go back and appeal so on that day, the judgment day, the day of heaven's Oscars, the day of heaven's Academy Awards, we are going to one by one be judged by the Lord Jesus at the judgment seat, not for our salvation. We're going to be judged for what we have done as believers between the moment of our salvation and when we ultimately stand before him. Let's notice, secondly, the distinction of heaven's awards. The judgment seat of Christ is not the final exam for heaven. Now, a lot of people think that one day you're going to stand before God in, in heaven's vestibule, and he's going to judge you for all of your works. If you've done enough good works, you'll get in. If you haven't done enough good works, you won't. That is an absolute error because the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches us that we who have trusted Christ will never again face our sin. It is forever behind us, and it is over. Galatians 1 4 says who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father 1 Corinthians 15 3 says 
For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also receive, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. 1 John 2.12 says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me just explain this again. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, all of your sins, past, present, and future, were forgiven. His blood covered it all, paid the debt for it all. You will never again have to stand before God and give an answer for your sin. Jesus paid it all, and all to him we owe. You will not have to ever face it. Somebody asked me, well, what about my future sins? I, I, I know that when I got saved, he took care of all my past sins. But what about all the sins I'm going to sin before I get to heaven? And I always like to ask him this question. How many of your sins were future when Jesus died for them on the cross? All of them. And God doesn't look at time the way we do. He paid for your sins. Are you with me on that? So when you get to heaven, you're not going to have to stand before the judge and give an account for your sin. The judgment seat of Christ is a place where you will be rewarded for your service to the Lord Jesus in your Christian experience. And one of the most asked questions that I get about this is, how can someone have his sins forgiven and still have to have his works reviewed at the judgment seat of Christ? The answer is found in this fact that forgiveness is about justification. And rewards are for the works which the justified have done in their flesh after their justification took place. These are not works which are done in order to be saved. These are works that are done because we are saved. In other words, when you become a Christian, you don't just go into limbo. You don't just you know, get into some sort of a fog until Jesus comes back. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians that by the grace of God, we have been saved through faith and not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then it says in the next verse, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that we should walk in them. No, we're not saved by good works. We're saved for the purpose of doing good works. So that after we become Christians, we're to let our light so shine that men will see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. This idea that because we're not saved by good works, that we should not ever do any good works is seem seemingly going on in the church these days because George Barna says, you can't tell any difference between the people in the church and the people out of the church. Maybe they've, maybe they've just believed this deceitful thing that if you're saved by faith, and you don't have to do any good works to be saved, that after you get saved, you shouldn't do any good works either. Because I know a lot of people that get saved and they just float. <laughs> they go nowhere. Well, one day they're going to stand before the Lord and give an account for their lives on this earth. Our eternal destination, according to Bruce Wilkinson, is the consequence of what we believe on earth. But our eternal compensation is the consequence of how we behave on earth. One is behavior, and the other is belief. And you know, there are, there are a lot of examples in the Bible, guys, that are uh, very interesting. People who started out walking for the Lord and blew it, made a big, big mess out of their life, even though they were continuing to be Christians. Go through the Scripture, and you'll see it. Lot, and Samson, Saul, Ananias, and Sapphira. They started out right. They were Christians all right, but after they became Christians, they... They just violated the things that were true and, and suffered some pretty awful consequences. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, it's not about whether you're going to get in heaven or not. You'll already be there. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, it will be about how have I lived my life as a believer? What kind of a steward have I been for the gifts that God has entrusted to me? And it won't be a time for you to bring formal accusations against other believers. That's a strange thing, isn't it? The judgment seat of Christ is when I finally get to nail that guy, you know? <laughs> Listen to me. All believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, each of us giving an account of himself to God. We have no right to judge the work of other believers. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes and will bring to light the things hidden in darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Then each one's praise will come from God. That's how it'll work. So are we together now? Here's what's going to happen. We're... Uh, we're either going to be alive when Jesus comes and be caught up, or we're going to be 
Uh, we're going to be dead. Our bodies will be in the grave. We'll already be with Jesus in our spirit and our grave. We'll open, we'll go up to be with the Lord, and as soon as we get to heaven, while the tribulation is going on down here on this earth, we each one are going to have our moment before the Lord for him to say to us, hopefully, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. That's what I want to happen to me. Amen? Now, interestingly enough, in the Bible, there are some Oscars described for us. And this is not by any means all of the awards that are going to be given. But there are five crowns that are listed in the New Testament for certain things, and it might surprise you some of the things that the Lord is going to reward when we stand before him someday. Number one, there's the victor's crown. It is recorded for us in 1 Corinthians 9, 25 through 27. Everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we do it for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now let me give you a little background and history to this experience that Paul writes about here in 1 Corinthians. Listen up. The Greeks had two athletic festivals, the Olympic Games and the Isthmian Games. The Isthmian Games were held at Corinth and would therefore be very familiar to those with who were reading Paul's letter here. Contestants in the games had to prove rigorous training for 10 months. The last month was spent at Corinth with supervised daily workouts in the gymnasium and athletic fields. The race was always a major attraction at the games, and that is the figure Paul uses to illustrate the faithful Christian life. Those who run in the race all run, but only one receives the prize, he says. No one would train so hard for so long without intending to win. Yet out of the large number of runners, only one wins. The prize indicates that the apostle had in mind service and rewards, not salvation and life. Paul's point is that athletes who expect to win must train diligently. But Isthmian athletes discipline themselves to win an insignificant prize. <laughs> How much more ought Christians to win an incorruptible, an unperishing prize? The thought, of course, is that of personal discipline. Walking with God, listen to me, walking with God demands personal sacrifice. Sacrifice of things not necessarily evil, but which prevent the full devotion of our soul to God. In an age of luxury like the time in which we live, the words have real significance for serious-minded servants of Christ. If you want to win an award, if you want to be standing there or receiving a crown, you're going to have to say no to some things so that you can say yes to some other things. You can't live this pleasure-gorged life that we have taught ourselves is normal in our culture today. You have to learn how to turn off the television sometimes so you can study to prepare your lesson. You have to learn how to get up when you don't feel like getting up in the morning so you can get into the Word of God and be ready for the day. You have to take time away from all the things that you want to do so you can get the Scripture in your heart. You've got to take a night out of your week once in a while and go talk to somebody about Jesus. All of this is hard, and it takes discipline. And the Bible says that a person who won't do that can't, he can't be a candidate for this, for this award. This award is given to those who discipline their body as Paul did who keep their body under control, and they become candidates for the victor's crown. Most people, including many Christians, are slaves to their bodies. Have you noticed that? Their bodies tell their minds what to do. Their bodies decide what to eat, when to eat, how much to eat, when to sleep, when to get up, and so on. An athlete cannot allow that. He follows the training rules, not his body. He runs when he would rather be resting he eats a balanced meal when he would rather have a chocolate sundae. He goes to bed when he would rather stay up. He gets up early to train when he'd rather stay in bed. An athlete leads his body and does not follow it. It is his slave, not the other way around. It is this kind of soldier that the victor's crown will be given. So some of you are saying, well, take me off that list. <laughs> take me off that list. You just, you had five waffles, four sausages, and two pieces of bacon for breakfast, right? No, I'm just kidding you. All of us need to learn this, and do we not all struggle with this? Every one of us. We want to be servants that the, the Lord can use, and it takes a certain amount of discipline in our life. And the Bible doesn't say we have to be perfect at this, but we have to be in training. Are you in training? Are you in training to serve the Lord? Are you trying to ask the Lord to help you become a better servant? 
God honors your heart in this matter. Then there's the crown of rejoicing. That's the second one. And you find that in 1 Thessalonians 2.19. This is what it says. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Paul asks the Thessalonians this question. He says, what is our crown of rejoicing? And then he answers it in the next phrase. He said, it is even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming. What is he talking about? He is saying that the crown of rejoicing is the crown you get because you led someone to Christ. He said, Thessalonians, let me tell you what the crown of rejoicing is. It's you because we ministered to you. And someday when we stand before the Lord, you're going to be there because we had a ministry to you. Sometimes it's called the soul winner's crown. It's the crown that Almighty God gives to us when we get out of ourselves and we stop thinking it's all about me and we start looking around for the people who need a touch from God and we use the talent and the giftedness he's given us to reach out with the gospel of Jesus Christ. When was the last time you ever talked to someone about Jesus who wasn't a Christian? Let me ask you another question. When was the last time you even thought about doing that? Well, we have some people in this church who they're just witnesses. They just talk to people all the time about Jesus. And they're candidates for the crown of rejoicing. Paul's love for these Thessalonians is very emotional. He calls them his joy, his hope, and his crown. And the crown is sometimes the soul winner's crown. Let's notice the third one, the crown of righteousness. It's found in 2 Timothy 4.8. Watch this. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who love his appearing. Now, Paul is prepared to meet the Lord. He is certain of his own eminent death as he writes this. He is content with his record of service and confident of his reception by the Savior. And Paul's use of the athletic metaphor is especially descriptive of the life of a believer because it describes struggle, endurance, discipline, and final victory. The crown of righteousness is reserved for those who have a longing for the Lord Jesus, who look for Jesus to come back. And you know what? Since I've been doing this series in heaven, I've had so many people either send me emails or notes or tell me personally that they're sort of embarrassed that heaven hasn't even been on their radar screen for so long. Isn't that interesting? Somebody said, why should I care about going to heaven? I haven't even been to Hawaii yet. You know, somebody, somebody sort of like that, you know? And it tells you a little bit about where our heart is. But there are some people who have their heart set on heaven and have their heart set on seeing Jesus Christ. And those are the people that will get this crown because they love the appearing of the Lord. Then there's the crown of life, number four. James 1.12 and Revelation 2.10. This is pretty easy to understand. Blessed is the man who endures testing, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Revelation 2.10. Do not fear any of these things which are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now watch this. The crown of life is given in recognition of enduring and triumphing over trial and temptation and persecution, even to the point of martyrdom. The motivation has to be love for Christ. When you go through the struggles and the persecutions that so many have gone through to preserve our faith, many of those people will be walking around in the early days of heaven with this particular crown of life because they suffered persecution for the cause of Christ. And I believe that in our culture today, there are many who are, who are entrusted with a great deal of suffering. Many of you have too. You go through it with the right spirit. You don't always ask him why, but you walk through the suffering and the trial and you carry yourself as a person of integrity and a man or a woman of God. Someday you'll stand before the beam of seat and God will say, you, you took it and you took it well and you honored me in the midst of it and here's the crown of life. Charles Wesley wrote a little hymn that I've never heard sung before, but these are the words. In hope of that immortal crown, I now the cross sustain, and gladly wander up and down and smile at toil and pain. I suffer out my threescore years till my deliverer come and wipe away his servant's tears and take his exile home. The crown of life. And then the last one is the crown of glory in 1 Peter 5, 4. And I'm a little excited about this because this is the preacher's crown. This is what it says. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. This crown is for those who are faithful shepherds of the people of God 
and for Christian leaders. He has one out of the five crowns that is reserved for those who are in leadership and who are shepherds of people. And you know what? You don't have to be a pastor or even on a staff. Maybe you shepherd a small group. Those of you who are facilitators and you shepherd that group and you care about all the people that come every week, you know who they are, what their names are, what their challenges are, and you pray for them and you shepherd them, you're in the running for the shepherd's crown, for the crown of glory. Now, have you got all those? Those are just a few. Those are the five that are mentioned by name in the New Testament. That will give you some idea what this is all about. This is not about being a Christian. You already are a Christian. You wouldn't be there. If you are not a Christian, you will not be in front of the judgment seat of Christ. There's another judgment called the great white throne judgment that comes a lot later. And if you're not a Christian, you'll get to stand before that one. But I want to tell you something. You don't want to be there. You want to be at this one. Because you will already be saved, you will already be in heaven, and the Bible says some of you are going to get to heaven yet so as by smoke or fire. In other words, you're going to skip into heaven with the smell of smoke on your clothes. I mean, that's kind of how it is. But you're going to be in heaven. Amen? Amen. But you know what? I don't want to be there like that, do you? I'm going to tell you a couple of reasons why as we come to the end of this message. But I want to give you some applications of how this works for us today. Let's, let's take note, number one. Remember that the Lord, your, the Lord himself is your chief reward. Don't ever forget that. Whatever else you may get in heaven, the Lord himself is your chief reward. In Genesis 15, 1, we read, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid. I am your shield, and I am your exceeding great reward. How many of you know the Lord God is your great reward? If you never got anything else, you get the Lord, you got it all, right? Amen? Remember, the Lord himself is your chief reward. Number two, resist doing works outwardly just for the purpose of getting an award. The book of Matthew, the Lord Jesus has some interesting things about posturing. I mentioned that earlier, posturing and spinning. Did you know Christians are good at that? We're really good at posturing and spinning and play acting. Listen to this, Matthew 6, 1. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have not re- no reward from your Father in heaven. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you himself openly. If you serve the Lord just so you can get a reward, it indicates that you don't understand Christianity. Why do you serve the Lord? Because you love him. And these, are, these rewards, these heavenly Oscars are for people who take it to the next level and throw themselves into serving the Lord with all of their hearts. I don't know very many people, I've never heard very very many people even mention who are serving the Lord just to get a reward. Somebody put it this way, in theory it might be possible to pursue eternal rewards with fleshly motives. However, I've never met anyone I've sensed was guilty of doing so. I've never heard someone say, I'm a missionary in the deep dark jungle because when I get to heaven I want a mansion that's bigger than the Joneses. I've never heard anything like that, have you? For myself, I can't ever remember thinking, if I witness to that guy, God's going to owe me big time. I mean, you don't think that way. You see, that's what he's talking about. Don't do do your service because you're saying, oh, I'm going to get this or I'm going to get that. You you, you, You know, if you're really an athlete, you don't run for the trophy. You run for the joy. Of the of the race and for the discipline and for the victory that comes in your heart the trophy is just something to keep around and remind you of the of the blessing of being in the race itself and then reflect on the ultimate goal of any rewards that you will receive what are we going to do with these crowns I don't know what they're going to look like but let me tell you what we're going to do with them watch this and the 24 elders fell down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Did you know that that's going to happen in heaven? After we get all our rewards and we're going to be so excited about it, then we're going to see Jesus, and we're going to take the only thing we have that's in heaven beside us, which is the crown he gave us, And we're going to fall down at his feet and give it to him and say, thank you, Lord, for helping me to be here. Thank you, Lord, for paying for my sin. Thank you, Lord, for being my redeemer. I haven't got much to give you, but here's my crown. And friend, I don't want to be left out of that. Do you? I don't want to be standing in the background watching everybody that I knew on this earth, bringing their crowns and giving them to the Lord Jesus. And because I was so lazy as a Christian, so undisciplined as a child of God, I've got nothing to offer. 
That would be a moment. And I'll tell you what, that is before he wipes away all tears. He wipes away all tears after this is over because there are going to be tears at that moment, I promise you. Well, I'm pretty excited about heaven and what the Lord has in store for us. There's a story that I've heard over the years. I almost didn't want to tell it to you because I'm sure some of you have heard it, but I don't know a better story to end this sermon with than this one. So listen up. There was an old missionary couple who had been working in Africa for years, and they were returning to New York City to retire. They had no pension. Their health was broken. They were defeated, discouraged, and afraid. They discovered as they got aboard ship that they had booked the same ship as President Teddy Roosevelt, who was returning from Africa and one of his big game hunting expeditions. No one paid attention to them. They watched the fanfare that accompanied the president's entourage with passengers trying to catch a glimpse of this great